Hi, everybody. My name's Kristen Fletcher. I'm the Programs and Engagement Manager here at the Haley Public Library. Tonight's talk is Pick Your Poison Botulinum with forensic chemist Kat Helms. This occasional series takes an entertaining look at the history, science, and uses of different poisons. Tonight, we feature botulinum toxin, the most poisonous substance known. I always like to feature a book um, from our library, and we actually didn't have one on botulism or uh, Botox, which we'll learn more about. Um, but we do have this book, um, the Yoga Facelift book. If you don't want to use Botox, uh, you can um, uh, check out this ebook and learn about all natural do it yourself program for looking younger and feeling better. So, who knew? All right, so it is my pleasure to again introduce Kat Helms. Kat has a Bachelor of Science degree in psychology from Vanderbilt University and in forensic chemistry from Virginia Commonwealth University, where she also served as forensic toxicology laboratory manager. In 2008, she received a Master of Science degree in molecular medicine from the University of Virginia at Charlottesville. She also has extensive experience as a science and math tutor and currently owns Cat Does Science, which provides local academic support and study strategies in math and science to middle and high school students. So Cat, I'm going to spotlight you here and uh, lovely to have you back um, uh, on the Pick Your Poison show. Um, it's been uh, incredibly uh, entertaining and very, um, what's the word, uh, insightful. Um, so here you go. You're being spot, spot lit. Great. Uh, thank you, Kristen, again, for having me in this sort of bizarre topic, but I'm glad that people are enjoying it. Um, you know, it's exciting to me, but it's nice to know it's exciting to other folks as well. So today we're going to talk about botulinum toxin, also known as the miracle poison. And I know, <clears throat> excuse me, the last lecture that I did on arsenic was really heavy on biochem. And it was a real deep dive into intracellular signaling pathways. And it was pretty deep for a lot of folks. And the reason for that was because arsenic is nonspecific. It goes after just about every cell type. Botulism is not that way. And so this one is going to be a lot more focused on the story of botulism and how this toxin particularly works because it is very specific. So buckle up. It's going to be a really fun journey and I hope everybody enjoys it. So here we go. Botulinum toxin, the miracle poison. So oops. And of course, I said that, and now I can't get there. It is. Ah, it's not. Okay. So, the bacteria that produces this toxin is actually called Clostridium botulinum. And it's this rod shaped bacteria. It's gram positive, it's anaerobic, and it forms these endospores. So, to take people back to high school bio yet again, if you remember, anaerobic bacteria grow without oxygen. In fact, oxygen is toxic to them. And if you are a gram positive bacteria versus a gram negative bacteria, you stay purple under a microscope. And the little picture that's on the right, I'll use my little pointer here. <clears throat> you can see these little pieces here. These are the endospores. So what the heck is an endospore? Well, an endospore is a way that the bacteria protects itself when exposed to hostile environments. So they contain the bacterial DNA and when conditions improve, the endospores dissolve, the bacteria go back to doing their bacteria things. So what the uh, endospore can protect you from are things like UV light, desiccation, extreme temperatures and chemical disinfectants. So this is how the bacteria protects itself in, on, in inhospitable environments. That's tough to say. So the toxin that the bacteria actually produces is the most poisonous substance known to man. <laughs> and it's actually a protein and you can see the structure of it in this picture here. So it's actually a, a protein that's made up of two subunits that work together. 
If you remember, we talked about LD50s, which is the lethal dose of 50% of a population that is exposed to a certain level of a toxin. And in humans, the oral amount, the LD50 is 30 nanograms per kilogram, tiny, tiny, tiny amounts. The LD50 inhalation is 0.8, uh, 0.8 micrograms, again, tiny amounts. Only 39.2 grams of pure toxin could kill every person on the planet. That's roughly seven tablespoons. I mean, this is this is some pretty pretty legit stuff. <laughs> and one gram of toxin can kill a million people. So when we say it's the most toxic substance known to man, we are not joking. <laughs> I know, terrifying. So why why would a bacteria create something this toxic? It just it blows the mind. Well, humans are not part of this bacteria's life cycle, so we're just, I don't know, for friendly fire, but <laughs> this is not where, where the bacteria designed um, the toxin to be its most lethal. It's just an unfortunate side effect. Botulism is actually a very serious problem amongst migratory waterfowl, and you can see this poor duck in the picture has some classic signs of botulinum toxin poisoning, which we'll talk about the classic symptoms, but it has to do with flaccid paralysis. So the shoreline of any body of water, as you probably know, is full of decaying organic matter. And that's home to anaerobic bacteria, not just clostridium, but other different subtypes. And that's also where these birds like to hang out and where they like to eat things. So what happens is the bird will eat some of this decaying matter the bacteria get into the bird gut and after the bird dies this is a great great environment for this type of bacteria to grow and so then the carcass of these dead birds becomes food for other organisms that come in and then also you get the maggots and the flies and all of the other insect activity that happens when an animal dies and all of that gets eaten by another animal and the cycle continues. And so the toxin, although not specific to humans, does play a role in the life cycle of migratory birds sometimes. So this is a, a, a quick question about that. Um, so if the duck dies, um, does the botulinum remain poisonous in that body. So if a fox came along and ate the duck, the dead now dead duck, so it would, I uh, forget what that's called, bioaccumulate up the ladder. So if a fox eats it, then, you know, and maybe a mountain lion eats the fox and okay. Yep. Well, okay. usually it'll stop at the fox. Um, but yeah, there is a there is a small level of bioaccumulation um, of this particular toxin. So yeah, we'll talk more about why that's the case and <laughs> and why exactly this this toxin works the way that it does its mechanism of action. But yeah, this was a reason reasonably recent discovery was this idea of Clostridium botulinum being found in these migratory birds. And you've had we've, there have been mass kill offs when they're, the pond is extremely unhealthy and you have high levels of anaerobic bacteria, specifically clostridium. And there's other subtypes of clostridium. This is also the bacteria that causes tetanus, but we're not gonna talk about that. <laughs> That's for another day. But yeah, so you get, these, um, you get these basically blooms of bacteria and then you get massive migratory bird kill-offs. They're not super common, but it does happen. So this, this isn't happening on such a massive scale that it's going to wipe out the entire biome, but it is worth noting that this is essentially the life cycle of the bacteria um, and how it propagates itself over lots of different places. Does that make sense? Okay, sweet. So we're going to move on. Yes. So that's the last thing. <laughs> so here we go. Botulism has three common forms. There's the foodborne botulism. This is the one that you hear about the most that you get from canned food that has been improperly stored. Um, you have wound botulism, which is when bacteria gets into a cut and causes an infection because this bacteria is found in the soil, not just Clostridium botulinum, but most of the Clostridiums and tons of other bacterial species. And then you have infant botulism, and this is when food causes that contain spores 
gets into a baby's digestive tract and then uh, the bacteria begins to grow and produces the toxin. And this usually is infants from two to eight months old. And we're really going to dive into infant botulism a little bit further. And then there's inhalation botulism, which is relevant to bioweapons development. <laughs> so we're going to talk about that as well. But those are the three common forms. Inhalation botulism is extremely rare. Okay, so what does exposure do? Well, the disease progresses in stages. So it starts with bilateral symmetric cranial nerve palsies with descending flaccid paralysis. That is a mouthful. <laughs> what that really means is bilateral and symmetric means it's happening on both sides and you have cranial nerves that innervate, innervate your head and your face. <clears throat> and so it starts to uh, affect those first. And so you'll get blurred vision you'll get what's called ptosis, which is these droopy eyelids, which take classic hallmark of the um, of botulinum poisoning. And you can see it in the picture right there, these droopy eyelids. You get slurred speech. You end up getting really dry mouth and throat. And as the paralysis works its way down your body, you will get skeletal muscle and flaccid paralysis. So flaccid paralysis means that your muscles are all loose, right? You can't actually flex. They're completely well, flaccid. So that works its way from top all the way to the bottom. Symptoms begin 18 to 36 just exposure and are dose dependent. Heavier the dose, faster the response. And they end up causing severe pain, difficulty breathing, respiratory failure, cardiac paralysis, and eventually death. This one's a bummer. All right. So why? Why does this happen? And why the descending paralysis? That's kind of bizarre. And it all has to do with the fact that botulinum is a neurotoxin. So this is a toxin that specifically targets the nervous system and disrupts normal functioning. Specifically, we are going after the neuromuscular junction of motor neurons. So to take you back to AMP class, motor neurons are the nerves that innervate or communicate with your muscle cells and so those nerves tell your muscles we should flex we should move we should you know what are we going to do today and they allow you to control skeletal muscle which is the muscle that you actually have control over um, and they also innervate uh, smooth muscle which we will also talk about and smooth muscle is the type of muscle that you don't have control over things like um, the dilation of your eyes, things like your heart, that's cardiac, and then other smooth muscle is things like your gut, the type of muscle that you don't want to have to think about all the time. So uh, your body does it automatically and it's controlled by these um, uh, neurons. And the toxin binds irreversibly and the effects can take weeks to months to resolve. Yikes. All right. Any questions on that? All right, moving on. I do, so, I do. It's always okay. me. Sorry. Okay. Um, no, la fine. last slide. Yes. So it binds irreversibly. So once it binds to the motor neurons, I'm guessing. Um, it let go. It, it never lets never go. Is that let okay? Yeah. And then what do you mean by the effects? Which effects take weeks to months to resolve? The flaccid paralysis. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So the droopy eyes, the slurred speech, and depending the dose as well. Um, yeah, it depends on the severity, of course, it's dependent on the dose, right? Um, Paracelsus dose makes the poison. But you know, if you have a little tiny exposure, then you're, it's a lot of times going to be localized, which is why Botox does what it does. And we'll get into more about how Botox is safe, even though it's what I've just explained to you is horrifying. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, yeah. This is sort of a slow burn, so just hold on tight. All right. So that's a picture of a nerve cell, and nerve cells conduct signals from your brain to your muscles and everything else to tell your body. <laughs> oh, there goes my dog. Oh, get him, Oscar. Get him. So, Oscar, buddy, that's enough. So. <laughs> So the toxin specifically targets these motor neurons. And so botulism enters the nerve cell body, which is this part right here. But you got to chill. Um, 
and then it slowly works its way down the nerve terminus right here okay so it works its way down what's called the axon this piece right here um, and eventually works its way to the nerve terminal which is where your neurotransmitters get sent out into the synapse and tell in this case your muscles to contract because this nerve is talking to a muscle okay it's a motor neuron so it it actually so remember how i showed you that let's nope <laughs> remember how i showed you that the toxin itself is a protein that's made up of two subunits one of the subunits docks the toxin protein to the cell body and basically injects the other part of that protein subunit and that's what travels down the nerve cell and it takes time okay and that's why botulinum holds on for so long so it's working its way down right um and it it goes and binds to the vesicles and nerve cells that contain acetylcholine and block their release into the synapse acetylcholine is necessary for muscle contraction. So if you block the uh, if you block the vesicles that contain acetylcholine, you can't get acetylcholine to tell the muscle cells to contract. That's why you get flaccid paralysis. And here it is. So the the protein of botulinum travels down to the nerve terminus right here, right? And these are the vesicles that contain acetylcholine. And suddenly, oops. Oh, I had an animation. It didn't show up. Oh, wait, no, it'll show up in the next one. Just kidding. Um, so yeah, so it'll travel down, right? It binds to these vesicles. And if you cannot release acetylcholine, you can't get your postsynaptic cell to, to give you a response. And so here's one more. And then there's, oh, there's my animation. So, <laughs> so one more time, the toxin moves down here. It binds to these blue circles, the acetylcholine vesicles. And everything else that's happening downstream will not happen now. No acetylcholine release means no muscle contraction. If you cannot contract your muscles, you can't move your diaphragm. If you can't move your diaphragm, you cannot breathe. And you also cannot get your heart to contract. And if you can't get these two very important things to work, it's not compatible with life, <laughs> we shall say. All right, so does that make sense to everybody about acetylcholine and the motor neurons and neuromuscular junctions and yeah so this is what botulism does all right okay so another really disturbing part of this is that this goes after motor neurons it doesn't affect your sensory system or your cognitive ability so you know this is happening to you and you can experience what's called locked in syndrome where you're perfectly aware of what's going on around you and in your body and you are aware that you are no longer able to breathe and there is nothing you can do about it Oof, don't like that <laughs> so that's one of the more disturbing aspects of uh of botulism poisoning all right we're gonna move on because that's creepy so infant botulism is a different from adult botulism right so in adult botulism you eat canned food that was improperly you know, made and you ingest the toxin and what we just talked about is what happens to you. In infants, it's different because they're actually ingesting the endospores of the bacteria. A lot of this is found in honey. And there's a reason why you don't get infants honey. It's because they can develop infant botulism. So once they've ingested the spores, infants have a naive gut flora. Like everyone knows about gut flora these days, which is fantastic. But this naive gut flora that's in infants, they can't stop these spores from colonizing their guts. Um, because in an adult, you have bacteria that will compete with clostridium and basically destroy it. But that's not what happens with infants. They're, they're just, they're naive with, their, um, with the bacteria that's in their guts. And so the spores will start to colonize. And when they start to colonize, they're gonna start producing this toxin and you get infant botulism and the hallmark sign is called floppy baby syndrome. So you can see this poor child in the picture has floppy baby syndrome. They have flaccid paralysis, they can't hold their heads up. If you hold them, they just sort of droop and you need to take them to the emergency room immediately. 
So that's a bummer. Um, so how do you treat this? <laughs> you can't. There's no cure for botulism poisoning. Um, there is an antitoxin for extremely severe symptoms that can neutralize circulating toxin, but the toxin that has already bound to your nerve cells, there's nothing you can do about it. It is bound, it's not letting go, you just have to ride it out. For infants though, there is this amazing product called Baby Big, and you can give this to infants to treat um, infant botulism, and it's immunoglobulin that's administered intravenously, and so it basically attacks the bacteria and gets it out of the gut. And then you can do supportive care until paralysis subsides, and this can take weeks to months. The reason for that is because once the, once the protein of the toxin binds to the acetylcholine vesicles, your cell has to start from scratch and make them all over again. And that takes time. Also, when you tell a cell, we're not sending out acetylcholine anymore, the postsynaptic cell or the cell that's waiting to receive the signal starts freaking out. Oh my gosh, why don't we have any acetylcholine? Maybe we need more receptors. And so that cell is also going to have to put in work making more receptors because it's trying to figure out where all this acetylcholine is going because it's just sitting around waiting. And this takes time, specifically a couple of weeks, a couple months again it's dose dependent does it make sense i hope i hope okay um so how do you prevent exposure well boil your canned food for a minimum of 10 minutes i know it's kind of a bummer if it's like peaches you don't want to boil peaches but you know most of the time this isn't really going to be an issue but if you see cans with dents or if you see cans that are sort of bulged a little bit be very careful um you know, so the rule of thumb is boil it for about 10 minutes or so that level of heat over that amount of time will denature the protein and lead it to be inactive. So, you know, especially if you're eating something that was home canned, because um, some people aren't as meticulous about their home canning and they're not really paying attention to either the pH levels or they're not boiling it long enough, things like that. So just just be aware and then wash wounds with warm water and soap because botulinum um, lives in the soil. And so if you scrape yourself and you get dirt in your wound, that is, there's a potential there for the bacteria to get into your body that way. All right, don't feed honey to infants. <laughs> we just talked about infant botulism, just don't do it. And then again, be very careful when you can your own food to avoid getting you know exposure. So to talk about the importance of being you know, aware when you home can. This is from the Walsh County record in the early 1900s and 12 dine with death in Grafton Farm Home. So this was, they, they got some home canned food from a neighbor and when they ate it, it ended in tragedy. So, you know, this isn't as common these days as it was back then, but it's still something to be aware of. Uh, in the past, 50 out of 100 people with botulinum died. Today, it's fewer than 5 out of 100. So the supportive care that we can give these patients has made an enormous difference and also the awareness of the symptoms and what to do if you think you've been exposed. So the current state of botulism. In 2017 in the US, there were 182 laboratory confirmed cases reported to the CDC. Botulism is a reportable disease. The vast majority are infant botulism. Um, but luckily we have baby big, so we can treat these and most of the time these infants are just fine. There is a relationship between the wound botulism and black tar heroin. So folks who are using dirty needles to shoot drugs have a higher risk of botulinum infection. And so this is something that nurses and physicians in the ER have been trained to look for. Um, so it's just part of the world we live in. So that's the state of botulism. It's a bummer. All right, so this is when we get into the crazy story of botulism, specifically as a bioweapon, because why not? Um, if we can find a substance that's super toxic and kills people really efficiently, why not weaponize it? 
So with the outbreak of World War II, the weaponization of botulinum research was restored to Fort Detrick in Maryland. The Army's Chemical Corps was disbanded, but not before Carl LaManna and James Duff developed the concentration and crystallization techniques. And Edward Chance used these techniques to create the first clinical product for experimental use and provided it to the academic community. So the US did try to weaponize botulinum, but realized it's not a really awesome you know, protein for that. Um, and here's why. Of course, it's enticing, but it's not a really good choice. There are better ones out there. It doesn't transmit person to person. The dosage is really hard to control. You can inactivate it by boiling it. Um, and there are some treatment options available. So, you know, there are better options for bioweapons out there. Botulinum isn't a really great one, but that didn't stop people from trying, such as the Japanese doomsday cold Amshamriko. So they produced botulism toxin and spread it as an aerosol in downtown Tokyo in the 90s. They were also responsible for a subway attack using sarin gas. The sarin gas, unfortunately, was effective. The botulinum attack, unfortunately, uh, was a total dud. No one was injured, and it's believed that they really didn't know what they were doing when they were trying to effect, uh, effectively extract the toxin from the cells. They just bred the bacteria and sent it out into the world, and that's not really how this toxin works. So good for us that they weren't awesome microbiologists, um, but that's Om Shimriko. You can read more about that particular uh, doomsday cult in Japan, if you wish. It's an interesting story. Uh, so after the first Gulf War in 1991, the Iraqi government admitted to UN inspectors that they had produced over 19,000 liters of concentrated botulinum toxin. Remember that one gram, <laughs> yeah, that's right, Oscar, you tell them, that one gram can kill 1 million people. 19,000 liters is enough to kill 18 billion people. We don't know where all that botulinum toxin went. So crush fingers, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, we're still trying to account for where all of it ended up going. <laughs> all right, moving on, because that's a bummer. So let's talk about why a lot of you, I'm hey, sure, wanted can, this. Can you up. hold yeah. on just a second, Kat? I just want to take a second and see if anybody um, has any questions. Um, we haven't gotten any questions yet. Um, uh, but I do have one question about the um, teenager and the baby that we saw uh, yes. in your earlier pictures. Did they recover? Yes. Okay. Yes. So both of those folks uh, were given supportive care. Yeah. So, and a lot of times, if the dose is small enough, you know, you'll get the droopy eyes, but the paralysis will stop. And so you could get, Oscar, you got to chill, buddy. Um, so you could get just the facial issues without having it extend all the way down to your heart and your diaphragm. But that droopy eyes and that, that floppy baby syndrome, those are super classic symptoms. And so if you, are, if you see someone with those, maybe ask them some questions. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's highly uh, recoverable mm -hmm. now. If you okay. See medical treatment soon. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And Kat and I talked earlier. Um, apparently, there's some construction happening near her, and every time they bang a certain way, it 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 triggers her dog. And you know, that's just the Zoom world we're in. So thanks everybody for your patience. And what's your dog's name? Oh, it's Oscar. Oscar. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So he's a corgi, and so he's always on patrol. So any strange <laughs> noise just sets him off. So hopefully. You got to chill, buddy. Um, but he's a sweetheart. <laughs> OK. Thanks for taking my. Oh, wait a minute. Oops. Nope. No questions yet. OK. okay. Um, well, we'll probably have some on on this next little segue into Botox. So I'm sure a lot of you are here because you want to learn about Botox. Like what? We're putting the world's deadliest bacteria into a syringe. What is happening? So <laughs> I'll explain why this is safe. <sighs> okay, so how in the world did the most potent toxin on the planet transform into a therapeutic molecule that we are injecting into our faces? <laughs> it seems so counterintuitive. Um, 
Oop, let me get this thing to go. Ah, there it goes. So remember that Fort Detrick was responsible for creating the crystallized protein. And then they sent it out to academic researchers to see if, well, we can't use it as a good bioweapon, but maybe someone out there can find a therapeutic use for it. And there's precedent for this. There are a lot of toxic molecules that are used in academic research to figure out either pathways or to look for therapeutic agents, especially painkillers, things like that. And so it's not unusual that, you know, human beings are going to try and find a, a beneficial use for something really awful. And Botox is the result of this. So in 1981, uh, researchers at Merck injected uh, botulinum toxin in extremely tiny, tiny, tiny doses into monkeys to see if it would treat cross-eyedness, which is strabismus, or also lazy eye and it worked. But they also noticed that there were reduced glabella wrinkles and the glabella is this space in between your eyes above your nose. And so the researchers noticed, man, those monkeys are looking real good. They don't have those wrinkles, you know, between their eyes and that glabella region. So we might be onto something here and they were. And so Allergan eventually licensed the treatment and branded it Botox. So, Get it? Botox, botulinum toxin. <laughs> Clever naming. So the additional uses for Botox include dystonia, which is inappropriate muscle contractions. Because again, remember that this is a toxin that produces flaccid paralysis. And so if you've got uncontrollable muscle contractions, this is a way to calm that down. It's also used for excessive sweating under the arms, although I don't know if you want to inject things in your armpits, but it's an option. Chronic headache and migraine. They're not entirely sure why this works, but it works. Overactive bladder, which makes sense. You're trying to calm these muscles down. And then muscle stiffness in the elbows and the fingers. And so all of these have been licensed by the FDA as um, other uses for Botox. The most common use of Botox is to treat wrinkles. This is what everybody knows it for. In 2018, there were over 7 million Botox procedures. It is the most common minimally invasive cosmetic procedure on the planet um, and a billion dollar industry. <laughs> All right, so why don't Botox injections kill you, right? Like it's the most toxic substance on the planet. You're putting it into your face. Shouldn't you be dead? No. And here's why. The injections are extremely shallow. They're not going like super deep like an IM injection, which is intramuscular. And they don't typically penetrate veins or arteries, so you don't actually get systemic dissemination of the toxin. The toxin stays local. And so if you want to get rid of wrinkles in your glabella, you target the glabella and you're going very uh, like subcutaneous. You're not going very deep and you know, you're not really gonna hit a vein if you're you know, putting things into your face. Um, and the dose is also extremely small, one three hundredth of the lethal dose. So it's a very, very tiny amount. One vial is equivalent to 100 units, which is 4.8 nanograms of toxin. And so even if a really irresponsible physician put the entire vial into your face, yikes, it's still not enough to be lethal. And so it's, it's been controlled for that. And remember that the toxin irreversibly binds to your motor neurons, and it takes between weeks and months for your nerve cells to regenerate the acetylcholine that it needs to kind of repair itself for normal functioning. And that's why Botox injections last as long as they do, but it's also why you have to keep going back to get multiple injections if you want to see prolonged effects. So I hope, hopefully that's cleared up the mystery of Botox. <laughs> I hope anyway. Um, so, but that doesn't mean that we should, you know, laugh about it and joke about it because botulinum toxin poisoning is still a very real thing. 
And in April 2017 in Walnut Grove, California, people remembered, oh man, this is a thing we should actually, you know, keep in our minds because several people fell ill and one died after eating nacho cheese sauce at the Valley Oak Food and Fuel Station. I think this is also a PSA on eating nacho cheese from a gas station. Maybe just grab a Twinkie or something next time. Um, so the public health officials were called in to try and figure out what in the heck happened. And when they tested the cheese, it was positive for botulinum toxin. So somewhere between packaging and the cheese being set out for consumers to put on salty, crunchy nachos, there had been some sort of contamination. And the heat that was keeping the nacho cheese warm was not enough to destroy the protein. And so you just have to be very, you know, cognizant of what you're putting in your mouth because it might have clostridium in it. Um, so, yeah. And just when you think, think things couldn't get any worse, we have a toxin update. So it used to be thought the botulinum type A was the most toxic substance on the planet. Ta-da! Botulinum type H was recently discovered. It is 500 times more toxic than type A. The equivalent of one grain of salt of type H could kill 50,000 people by injection. So uh, you are very unlikely to run into botulinum type H in your daily life, but uh, I, I found that update and was just too juicy not to include. <laughs> All right, so as always, I like to end with the poison helplines, just in case you or someone you know may have been exposed, please call and get information and help. Um, you know, botulinum toxin, it's still out there and you should be aware of it, uh, especially in infants with their risk of exposure to infant botulism. Um, you know, and just be careful out there, people. <laughs> and then this is a list of, uh, of my sources. So there's some, uh, there's some good things in there. Um, of course, the Mayo Clinic and the CDC are always great websites to get some information. Um, but that's where we are with the state of botulinum toxin. So does anyone have any questions, any comments, any personal experiences they want to share? <laughs> so I'll wait just a second if anybody wants to Ooh. jot down those um, numbers. Uh, I will also send them out in the email, the follow-up email that I send that um, has the, uh, uh, um, the link to the talk. So, um, Let's see. So I am going to stop your share. And here we are. Um, let's see. Do a gallery view. Um, I wanted to share a personal story uh, with folks. Um, uh, when I was living in Pocatello, I had a lovely dog who I adored with every fiber of my being. Um, and one late afternoon, she came running into the house, um, panting, her eyes were all wild. Um, she, had, she was frothing at the mouth, she was shaking, um, and it was very unlike her. And she um, came right up to me, sat right next to me and just trembled. And then she threw up um, and I called my vet and the vet said that you should call the poison hotline. So I called the poison hotline. Um, they responded immediately, that same number that Kat just showed. Um, and uh, I gave, told him the symptoms and he said, I think your dog has eaten a neurological poison. And um, he said, it, what, what could it be? And I said, I have no idea, um, absolutely no idea. And he said, well, you should, take your dog to the vets and um but right away and we'll see um hopefully we can save her uh so 
I'm a pretty cautious, deliberate, defensive driver, but I wasn't as I wove through traffic in downtown Pocatello to get to the vets, which was exactly as far away from my place as you can get. Um, she was there, she looked her over um, uh, and said she, I don't know what it is, but some sort of neurological poison. And so she gave her a shot um, and then she wasn't coming around. And then she gave, um, she gave her a second shot of something. Uh, and that was almost too much, um, but she ended up um, uh, coming around. Um, uh, she went on IV, she stayed there a couple of days. Um, she ended up being just fine, basically. Uh, and she asked me if, if there was any like rotten food around. And I said, boy, not that I know of. I mean, both my neighbor and I have a, a compost pile um, in a, one of those plastic containers, you know, where you put the stuff on the top and you're supposed to get dirt out the bottom. Um, and he said, well, possibly, it, you know, had anybody been moving their compost pile? I said, well, actually, I think my neighbor, John, mentioned he was going to move the compost pile to a new place. So a couple days later, um, and John and I were super tight neighbors. So a couple days later, um, I asked him about it. I just said, hey, did you, did you move your compost pile? And he said, yes, he had. And I said, well, here's the thing. Um, I think Raven ate something that was left over um, and I said, I'm not accusing you. I, I know how responsible you are. I just, I just want to inform you. Um, and he said there had been soft, gooey, smelly gunk at the bottom of the compost pile. It wasn't dirt. He said, we scraped it up with shovels. We deposited it in our, you know, plastic dumpster. And he said, I, th I thought we did a pretty good job, although Raven was over there um, and kind of sniffing around. And I said, well, you know, let that be a warning to both of us um, that uh, I don't know if it was botulinum, um, but it, I mean, scared me to death. Um, she made it, uh, but uh, uh, it was a horrifying experience. Uh, I felt so helpless. I mean, I mean, she was like almost um, going through seizures almost in the back of the car and just her eyes were wide and she was pacing back and forth and, and um, it was really a horrible experience. So um, this is something that uh, that can come when you least affect, you know, expect it. And um, uh, so uh, watch those compost piles and those rotten, rotten foods. So yeah, it doesn't sound like botulinum, but it does sound like some sort of anaerobic bacteria. Yeah, there are a bunch of them out there, and uh, several of them produce toxins, especially the bacteria that are in the family of, of Clostridium. So, mm -hmm. like I mentioned before, the Clostridium bacteria not only produce this botulinum, but they're also responsible for responsible for tetanus and some other things. And so, you know, it's it's a real concern. Mm -hmm. um, so that's I, I was. I remember when you first told me that story, I went, oh, please tell me the dog makes it because I'm going to lose it if, if Raven doesn't make it. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for telling us she made it. Ah! Well, and uh, it's interesting because all this time I've thought it was botulinum. Um, but then today when you were going through the characteristics of, of the poisoning yeah. of it, I thought that does not sound like what Raven went through at all. So Yeah, because they would experience this flaccid paralysis and then you know, the super droopy eyes. I mean, it, 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 you saw the duck mm -hmm. from the picture that was talking mm -hmm. about the migratory birds and their exposure to Clostridium botulinum. And it's just this very floppy flaccid paralysis. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's pretty telltale um, that particular, um, that particular symptom. So mm -hmm. yeah, but ooh. <laughs> yeah. So she made it though. She made it, which was so, great. Oh. Yeah. Um, anybody have any questions for Kat since we've got her here? Um, anybody thinking about a Botox treatment? And you know, it's interesting. They always show these beautiful young women usually getting Botox treatment for just the tiniest little wrinkle in their forehead. So <laughs> I don't know if that's typical, but uh, I, I thought that was amusing um, to see your well, pictures. When I was doing my research for this particular uh, lecture, I, I came across that a lot of women in their 20s are doing Botox 
as a way of doing prophylaxis. And I thought, oh dear. Um, but it's a thing that's happening. And mm -hmm. since it's, you know, it's easy to get someone to do this for you. And there's, you know, there are Botox parties and all these things. So, you know, you have to weigh, you know, your choices against, you know, whether or not you want to do Botox or not. Um, I've chosen to age gracefully, but, <laughs> but that's just me. Um, but I think it's helpful to know what it is that you're putting in your face, um, you know, because everyone believes that, oh, if it's being prescribed by a physician, then it's harmless. And, and that's not necessarily true. Your risk uh, from a Botox injection is extremely minimal. But a lot of people are not aware of what exactly Botox is. They just think mm. it's just this magical little um, clear liquid. But no, it's it's the most toxic substance on the planet. It is botulinum type A, so at least they're not putting H in your face. But uh, <laughs> that that can have a different ending. Um, but you know, it's something to be aware of. And and there are several off label uses for Botox as well. Um, which are not FDA approved, hence the off-label use, but there continue to be more and more studies about its efficacy for things like pain management um, and also, you know, extremely rare conditions, which there are very few treatments for. And so it could be that, you know, Botox will just become ubiquitous in our healthcare in the future. Who knows? Um, but that's, I read someplace that um, it was being used maybe experimentally at this point um, but to, to help cure cross-eyedness. And I assume that that's to relax the muscles of the eyes. Is that yeah. how that works? So that, that was the original study was to look to see if it would cure strabismus. And it is extremely effective. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's definitely used for that. That's not the most common use now. Obviously, it's for wrinkles. Um, but I remember several years ago, there were commercials for Botox for migraine headache. And that one is harder to parse out the mechanism of action because no one's 100% sure why migraine headaches occur, what makes them last. You know, it's, it's a very, you know, vague topic. But it appears that doing um, injections of the cranial area does help mitigate some of the symptoms hmm. uh, no one knows why but it is helpful and so that is actually an on-label use that the fda fda has approved so yeah good somebody um, was just asking about migraine treatments but you just answered it yeah. So yeah. maybe you could talk so, a little bit because <laughs> um, how does it work with with wrinkles? Um, I guess I thought it was something that was injected in that filled the space where oh, the like wrinkle a filler. Yeah. yeah. So wrinkles typically occur from right. So I'm doing that with my muscles, and so consistently doing that with my muscles, or you know, squinting will give me the crow's feet, things like that. Um, and so those are happening when your muscles contract and the skin that's attached to your muscles also gets pulled into that whole mess. And so when you inject Botox into your face where there are wrinkles, remember it causes flaccid paralysis. So it prevents your muscles from contracting. And so if your muscles don't contract, then you aren't gonna get these and these, right, these or wherever it is you're putting it. Um, I feel secure enough that I can point to my claws and there's an educational resource. But yeah, <laughs> so it's the lack of paralysis that happens as a result of the toxin binding with your motor neurons that makes you, and people joke that you can't express emotions. You're like, am I smiling? And I, am I smiling, right, because of Botox? because it, it alleviates the ability for you to actually control your skeletal muscle. Um, you know, so if you have a bad Botox injection, you could end up having like the droopy eyes or, you know, I can't smile, am I smiling? So, <laughs> so you can't control your skeletal muscle, but it's by relaxing the muscles underneath the skin that the wrinkles are they not necessarily eliminated, but the appearance of them looks less obvious mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and because 
the toxin binds irreversibly, you know, and it lasts between weeks and months. So you're going to get that effect for a decent amount of time. But again, you're going to have to keep getting injections if you want to keep that effect, you know, going. Hmm. So, but it does last for a decent amount of time. So if you do get a bad injection and, you know, you look a little funky, it's going to take you a couple weeks or possibly a month or two until you have normal facial movements again. So you want to go to a provider who has done this before and knows what they're doing. Um, you know, so a lot of people go see plastic surgeons or uh, specialists in plastics in order to get their Botox injections. Hmm. Um, for that particular type of cosmetic procedure. Mm. Yeah, so that's why it alleviates the wrinkles or at least the appearance of wrinkles mm -hmm. by causing your muscles to be all flaccid and loosey-goosey. <laughs> so uh, Colton asks, is the Botox in the vial the actual spore or is it the proteins that is produced? Great question. It's the protein. Yeah, it's the protein. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, it's purified and a lot of it used to come from, uh, this is gonna gross people out, but it came from pigs. So they would uh, they would infect the pigs with, it's so gross, they would infect the pigs with the bacteria and then harvest the toxin that it made. That's not how it's done anymore. Now mm. it's actually um, made in a laboratory on a grand scale, but hmm. uh, yeah, that's how it used to be made. So you hmm. used to be injecting pork, pork toxin in your face, um, but not anymore. So hmm. that's right upon. <laughs> right. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> but yeah, it's the protein and it's in such tiny amounts um, that, you know, there's, there's no chance of lethality from that particular injection. Hmm. Hmm. Good question. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I don't see any other um, questions. I'm just going to speak slowly in case there's one that's been in the back of somebody's mind and they just haven't gotten around to typing it in. So, well, uh, Kat, I will thank you again uh, for a uh, unusually entertaining talk about poisons um, and uh, the next program that she's going to do is going to be in February yeah, I think early it's March. early March and it's mm -hmm. on the puffer fish um, do you want to talk about that just a wee little bit to oh, I would um, love to this this is a toxin that I I don't know if you can love a toxin but I love it um, <laughs> I think it's so it's called tetrodotoxin. Um, you may have heard of it, you may not have, but it's popular in, well, pop culture. It's found in mainly in the puffer fish, is what everyone knows it for, but it's also found in the blue ring octopus, which a lot of people are aware of because that's a very deadly marine um, critter. And it's also found in certain frogs and salamanders and things, but the puffer fish is the one that everybody associates with chitrodotoxin. And just like botulinum, it's extremely specific in how it works, but also like botulism, the story behind it is just fascinating. Um, so botulinum goes from, you know, bioweapon to, you know, something that we put in our faces to make us look pretty. And that's a crazy story, like what? Um, and tetrodotoxin doesn't have the bioweapon component to it and we're not injecting it in our faces, thank goodness. But the stories about it and how it has weaved its way into particular cultures and in cer certain rituals is fascinating. And I think people will really, really enjoy that. And then um, because the mechanism is relatively similar to botulinum, It'll be a great way to put on your toxicologist hat and think about how different toxins, even though they may seem similar, act differently and, and how you can kind of compare and contrast them. And so I think it's going to be a really fun uh, lecture, not just because I'm super psyched about it, uh, but because I think it'll be entertaining and fun and you're going to walk away with it going, what? So, <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's going to be really fun. So I hope everyone comes to that one. Yep. And then we'll conclude this series uh, for now anyway, with um, 
uh, the Amanita mushroom, right? Yeah. Uh, the, the death cap. Yes. Death cap mushroom. So well, that should be. Same family, so we should. Oh, are they? Okay. Yeah. Yep. So I'm learning as we go along too. So um, <laughs> we'll send out information about that one. Again, Kat, thank you very much for your entertaining you. look at terrible things. <laughs> and uh, thanks everybody for joining us here tonight. Uh, we'll see you so next long. time. Bye. <laughs> Bye.